Hi everyone, it's the tiniest one back with another video for you and today we're going to be taking a look at the processor that could quite possibly be the only processor in the 11th gen lineup that is making AMD sweat a bit or at least it's making AMD realise that they can possibly sometimes chuck something up which is competition. It's weird the way things have switched around but I love it but we're with the 1100F. Now the reason why it's kind of a bit of a shocker is yes it only goes to 4.4 gigahertz that's not all core either it's about 4.2 all core but it's 150 pounds for a six core 12 thread processor 150 quid for a processor now normally i would have put that processor in a z590 board that i tested the other i5 and the other i9 with but i've been i've gone about it in a slightly different way today and i've teamed it up with a Prime B560 Plus. Now I am going to be reviewing other motherboards. This is just the one I'm using to test the processor with this time. When I test the other B560 boards, I will put the i5 in those as well. So this is just the first of many. But uh, this board, and the reason why I've started with it, is 119 pounds. So that means you can buy a processor and a motherboard for 270 quid. Now that's a bit mental considering that's less money than a 5600X and it's only just a little bit more than buying an 11600K. And now this could unlock ways for you to spend a little bit more money on your graphics cards if you have to go through unofficial routes. I'd like to hope not. I'd be living on the e-tailers websites if it was me. But anyway, it could be an interesting one for us to see how these two perform. Okay then, so quite the bundle and a slightly different way for me to have uh, gone about things. Now uh, I'm going to cover some bits with the processor first. 4.4 gigahertz is the upper limit, it's normally like a single core uh, turbo so you get that and you do see it quite readily as well when it's flicking around on the desktop and it's doing stuff if you run all core you get about 4.2 gigahertz now trying to make things slightly more personal one of the questions on the tiny tom logan facebook page which i would love if you would like to go over and follow but it's from a regular contributor called tom davis he comments all the time normally massive posts puts a lot of uh, effort into his questions and when he's trying to help other people as well. But anyway, he asked about uh, MCE with the Asus boards, and that's multi-core enhancement. Now, that is something which probably could be unlocked in the BIOS, but I'm assuming that Intel have kind of said, leave these things alone. Now, Asus in the past would have been the brand to have done naughty things with the BIOS, left them out there, and then fixed them later when they got told off by Intel. So I'd like to think that this is something that they could do because there is no real tweaking for cores. So you can't lock all the cores to 4.4, for example. If you do, it just locks them all to 4.2. So that's as best as you can do, is you can make all the cores just stay at 4.2 gigahertz. There's no MCE. They do have in the BIOS, what's listed as the ABT, uh, it didn't particularly seem to make a great deal of difference in my testing, whether it was on or off. Uh, I did try some undervolting and some tweaking uh, in that regard. Didn't really make a lot of difference either, if I'm completely honest with you. Might need a little bit more uh, hands-on time, but one of the things that I'm going to say now, which you'll probably see later on in the review, is this does feel like a good entry level fit and forget processor and when you see the data later on I think you'll start to understand where I my thoughts are going with it now I'm going to go in with the power draw straight away because we always put all of this information on the written review which is on the website so if you'd like to see any more data if you'd like to see any more graphs go and read the full thing then you can head over to the oc3d website and the link will be underneath it will be a card in one of the corners and you can go and take a ganders now uh it pulls more power than a 5600x with precision boost overdrive or an overclock put in play 
um, and it's only just slightly less power draw than a 3600 XT. So as far as it's concerned with power draw, I'm starting off with the bad stuff, it's not great. You can see it's old tech. The fact that AMD have got a processor out there that runs higher clock speeds, but it's got the same amount of cores, but draws less power. I cannot believe we're at the point <laughs> where AMD is the power efficient processor. And I think that's quite hilarious. But trying to add some balance in, at this end of the market, uh, 150 quid for it to be sipping a little bit more power to possibly eat things up that little bit better. That is something for you to decide about at home. Would you like to save half the price on a processor and then pay a few extra cents or pence towards your electric bill? Because at the 20 watts, it's not really going to break the bank, but I'm going to leave that with you at home. At the end of the day, it does draw more power and that in itself, I think, is kind of hilarious. Now, uh, with uh, temperatures, we tested all the other processors with a 360 mil AIO because that's when we go into the overclocks and we, we just want to see how well we can get it without there being thermal limitations. With the 11600K, it wasn't too bad with this. With the i9, it, even the i9 over flooded this, even with the fans running crazy, crazy speeds. So when you see the AIO for this, the 11400, I don't particularly think that the AIO well, you wouldn't buy it for this. It's too much money, unless you already had one, or you've won one in a competition, or one of your mates decided to give you one, or you know someone like me, and they're like, do you want this? Because I've finished with it, and then you might be lucky. But I genuinely don't think this is the sort of thing that you do. But some of you out there on a really tight budget might be forced into using the stock Intel cooler that comes with it. So the data's in the graph. Now we did blender runs, those blender runs, I will say, the blender runs were run for like five or 10 minutes just to kind of get a warm up. But the F1 2020 I did, uh, I put the benchmark on loop for 30 minutes so that you get a good gaming aspect. Because with a processor like this, you're not likely to be doing a lot of blender stuff. I think 95% of you out there are just going to be playing games or looking on Facebook or maybe watching like YouTube videos or some other uh, a video content that you can easily find online. Ding! Um, so I don't think a lot of you will get to the point where you're going to be busting all of the cores all of the time with something like Blender. But that was why I rolled out the games for this because I actually don't think this cooler is any good at all, even for gaming. Because with F1 2020, as you can see, we managed to get it to 100 degrees and it was on four of the cores so it wasn't all of them but they were consistently at 100 degrees during the uh, gaming sesh and F1 2020 isn't even a particularly stressful game now when I do a game test I will have been running it at 1080p because I want the frames to be high to stress the processor out because if you run something like Fortnite that's gonna have the same kind of hit so I don't think this cooler is worth it at all. To the point, I will say now, that unless you are completely stuck, please, if you're gonna buy this processor, treat yourself to even a basic 120 millimeter cooler. Because yes, this is an Octua, and it's like, it's 100 quid, which is a lot of money, but any 120 millimeter cooler will do you fine. This Noctua managed to keep things under 60 degrees, uh, with all of them. As you can see underneath, you can see that the 120 millimeter AIO there, Blender 56, Gaming 48. Now the most important thing here is that bottom one. You can see there's a four degrees difference between this bonkers one and this not so bonkers one. But then more importantly, if you go to F1 2020 at the top with a stock cooler, it's 100 degrees. So adding a 120 millimeter cooler to this, halved the temps consistently. So you can pick up a 120 millimeter cooler for about 30 pounds. Yes, this one's slightly more expensive, but just go and find one that's from a reputable band. Even if you've got one like the Cooler Master 212, 
they're about 30, 35 pound. Go and grab it, it will keep your life cooler and it will keep your life quieter. And if it's cooler, you've got a better chance that you're gonna get a consistently higher boost speed as well because you're gonna to wanna to make sure that it's hitting that 4.2 rather than once it starts to get hot, it will back those boost, temp those boost speeds back so that it keeps the temperatures slightly in check. So the extra 30 quid is a, is a no-brainer in my personal opinion. Now you could say that then that makes a 150 quid processor 180 pounds because you have to go and spend some more money on it. But I would personally say that with the 5600X, you should have done the same sort of thing anyway. So I think it kind of balances it out. So the temps were there for you to absorb. On to something like Blender. I've done the Blender runs as we would have done and it's got the full suite of all the other CPUs in there. But like I've said, in reality, I don't particularly think that it's something that you're going to be considering. But something I did kind of find a little bit funny was it was quicker than a 10600K with an overclock. So in that regard, do you know what I mean? It's got a little bit more power than the previous generation, slightly further up the stack processor. So it's done all right. Same with Cinebench R20, it's done all right. It sits where it, you know, you would kind of expect. But I do think that the shocker with it is the price. But then we move on to the games, which I would say is the most important thing with this. Now, what you do need to remember with these games is I've not put them in the list of all the other CPU games because with the list of all the other CPU games, we only really did um, the very CPU intensive ones. So you'd have had Total Warhammer, you would have had Sid Meier's, and I think we used to do uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider as well, just to kind of mix up a bit. So these are the very recent ones that we've done with the 600K, 5600X, and now the 400F. So it's all around the kind of semi to right part price point. I know you've not got reams of old 10th gen processors here, but if I was to go back and retest them all with a 3080, it would take me two or three weeks of testing to go through all of the CPUs, building all of the different rigs. So I've kept it kind of on point and fairly similar. You can though, if you want, click to the OC3D website and go and cross check the other reviews because they, uh, other than the games, it, they, all, they are all directly comparable. Um, now, something that I do like with this is there are times where the 11400F isn't at the bottom, like with Microsoft Flight Simulator, but you know, you can make your own mind up. But then when we go on to Dirt 5, it's not necessarily at the bottom either, but there are ones where it does sit at the bottom. Uh, I can't remember which one it is, but there are ones on the um, uh, website, if you want to go and have a look, where they do quite literally, it, it will sit at the very bottom. It's normally the very CPU intensive ones. So I am telling you that it can be at the bottom of this graph. I've not just picked these. All of the data is on the website. So it's all public, it's all visible, you can go and see them all. I tested 14 different games just so that you can uh, absorb it if you want. Um, now, you've got all of the resolutions with these graphs, but so that means there is 1080 in there, there is 1440 and there is 4K. I personally want to look at the 1080 results though, not because I'm gonna run it like that, just so that we can see the hardcore differences between them. And that's the way the graphs have been ordered as well. Uh, so there's been a good amount of uh, game data there for you. There's been a good amount of other data there for you. Now, it's a strange one in that Intel has a budget option that seems quite competitive. Drawback, it does draw a little bit more power. Drawback, the cooler that comes with it is pretty crap. Uh, but if I'm completely honest, whenever I buy a processor, I pretty much want to put a different cooler on it straight away anyway, so that you can keep it cooler, but more importantly, so it's quieter. I know some of you out there will have your cans on, but you know, if it's a really noisy thing, then it can be heard in other rooms, it can, you might be gaming in the same room as your family that's watching the telly or something, it's just kind of kinder and nicer. So an absolute dead cert is you are gonna to need to spend a little bit more money on a better cooler, and this should be turned into some kind of like flavor flav, key um, a pendant or I don't know like uh, I genuinely don't know I don't know put it on the floor so your cat can like 
bat its hand on it to play with it. I have tried to get my cat to do that, but she wasn't having any of it, so she's not impressed with it either. But pairing these two together for 270 quid, add a cooler on, let's call it 300 pounds. I think that's going to be a pretty epic base for most of you out there. Yes, I know you're probably not going to be running this kind of uh, graphics card. You're either going to have something like, if you can get them, yes, a 3060 uh, or an RX 6700. And I think it would be a perfect stable mate as well. Get the cooling sorted. Uh, and then the rest of it is your oyster. And I think at that point you have the basis for a great budget gaming system. Uh, now, uh, some people say, oh, Intel paid for this video. They really didn't. They wouldn't like me saying things like they draw too much power and laughing and all that sort of stuff. I wish they did because I, I, you know what I mean? If people want to spend money, then absolutely fine. But they didn't. This is just me doing what I consider to be in my job. And I'm exploring options in the market at the moment. Now, I will say that I personally think that the last kind of six months have been very underwhelming. I don't think the situation with the graphics cards has helped matters either. Um, and it's because of that, the fact that a lot of you are sitting on e-tailers websites trying to get graphics cards or having to pay eBay prices is why this kind of makes a little bit more sense. Because if you need to spend money on a graphics card, you're gonna to wanna to save it in other areas. And this is a perfectly acceptable processor. 1080p will stress the bejesus out of it with a decent graphics card. But once you've stepped away from incredibly expensive graphics cards, it's gonna do the job fine. And I personally think this is a 1440p system with a reasonable graphics card with some very consciously bought parts will give you just as much enjoyment as if you'd spend twice the amount. It's only really going to be if you're thinking 1440p and high refresh rates that things are going to start to get stressed. Because if you think high refresh rates, then you need to remember that not only does the CPU need to keep up, but if you want 144 hertz, then you kind of need your graphics card to be able to do 144 or somewhere close to it frames per second so that they're kind of in the same kind of ballpark because it's no point having a 144 hertz screen if your graphics card's only giving you 40 frames per second. That is also something that you should probably be keeping in mind. But let me know what you think underneath. I would very much enjoy your feedback, but for now, at least, this has been the tiniest one with a budget gaming system kind of idea set up. Definitely gonna be getting more videos out of this sort of thing, aren't we? Out. Ding! And thanks for your input, Tom.